Are you familiar with Vecna? Well, you should be, because Vecna is familiar with you. And that's right, this is the second video in a row to reference Vecna in the opening 10 seconds. But Vecna is very important to this monster this week, because Vecna had a hand, not that hand, in creating this monster, and that's why you should be aware of who Vecna is. So who the heckna is Vecna? Well, Vecna is the undead lich god, once mortal turned lich turned undead deity by his own powers of skullduggery. And you should also know that the holy signs for Vecna are the hand of Vecna and the eye of Vecna, both of which were removed from Vecna when things didn't quite go his way and he got in an argument with his boyfriend. I mean, just look at the guy. He was hitting way above his weight class when he went after Cass, but yet it worked out for him until it didn't. In any case, this video is not about Vecna. It is about one of Vecna's many servants, specifically the Vitreous Drinker. Welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old monsters from past editions of Dungeons & dragons and convert them for use in your current fifth edition game. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and as I mentioned, this week's video is about one of the Lich God's cronies. So what exactly is a vitreous drinker? Well, as their name would suggest, they drink things. What do they drink, you ask? Well, they drink eyes, specifically sight. That's right, these creatures have the ability to steal sight from other creatures and then use that other creature's eyes to see the world around them, while of course also making that creature sort of blind. But we're gonna get into the mechanics of exactly how that works later. All you need to know to get started is that these creatures are super gross looking. They're somewhat humanoid in shape, but with very hunched backs, huge long prehensile tongues that hang out of their mouths, and their bodies are covered in eyeballs. It's pretty gross. Like, what the heck? But that is why they are going to make the perfect monstrous addition to Spooky Month, where we talk about all the unsettling and grosser monsters, I mean, even grosser than usual, and these guys are the perfect fit, in my opinion. I mean, just look at them. Look at them. He's looking at you, but he can't not look at you. That's all he does, is looks at things. I mean, what do you even need that many eyes for? But I digress. First things first, we are gonna talk about combat and go over just exactly what these guys do in battle, what makes them so terrifying, and then we're gonna talk about some plot hooks and some ways that you can use them in your campaign or maybe in your upcoming Halloween one-shot adventure. So first things first, let's talk about doing battle with the only creature who can make a beholder jealous in terms of how many eyeballs it has and get to... Uh, well, yours. Uh -oh. So as you might be able to guess, a creature like this who is created by and follows a deity that is all about magic and secrets obviously has a ton of spells and magical abilities at its disposal. There are spells you'd totally expect it to have, like Arcane Eye. I feel like that one's just a sick joke. But it can also do things like detect thoughts, cast tongues, and cast Flock of Familiars. More on that spell specifically in a minute. It can also do things like Vampiric Touch, which allow it to touch a creature, deal some damage, and heal itself, and cast spells like Eye Bite, which aside from being thematic, is also a really nasty spell. It allows you to impose all kinds of different disadvantages and hexes and that kind of thing on other creatures, and you can do multiple hexes per round. Seriously, look up the spell and read the description because it's super long, but it's just a bad time. And of course, in its once per day list, it has two spells, one of which is basically an oh shit button, Dimension Door, which when this creature needs to get out and get out now, it can teleport a distance away. And the other spell being an oh shit button, but a bit more of an aggressive one, Finger of Death, which as the names would suggest, you point your finger at someone and it kills them. I mean, not outright, but it causes a lot of damage. And if it does kill them, that person is raised as a zombie, which is, Horrible. It's always dangerous when monsters have the ability to take out one of the party members and then also gain a new ally. That's why creatures like wraiths and specters are so dangerous. And there's no exception here. Granted, it can only do this once a day, but that's why. Now, as I mentioned before, and as you can plainly see based on this image beside me, this creature is covered in disgusting, bulbous eyeballs. So it would be kind of weird if this creature didn't have at least one eye-based attack, and surprise, surprise, it does. It has an ability called a Horrific Gaze, which is very similar in function to the way a Medusa's Gaze works. And no, it doesn't petrify creatures, but when you start your turn within 30 feet of this thing, and you're not averting your eyes from it, 
you have to make a constitution save, and if you fail, you're stunned until your next turn. So it's not as severe as being petrified, but it is still pretty scary. Because you have a choice here. You can avert your eyes and not look at the creature, but that means you can't see the creature, so then you're also taking disadvantage on your attack rolls against it. Or you can look that thing right in its face, and when you do so, you don't suffer disadvantage or anything like that, but there's a chance you won't be able to act at all. So I guess it just depends on how confident you are that you can make a DC 16 con save. It's very much a risk reward mechanic, which I often enjoy in fights, which is part of the reason why I find Medusas are so much fun to run in combat, and I'm sure this creature is no exception. But one thing I'm sure you're wondering when you look at the artwork of this creature is what is up with that long, sopping tongue? Well, let me tell you, nothing good. See, the one and only physical attack that this creature has is called Tongue Lash. It has a 10 foot range and it can do this twice per round because it has multi-attack. Doesn't cause a crazy amount of damage, 3d6, that's nothing huge. But the reason that you need to be worried about this isn't just because of the damage. I mean, it's also very gross. But this informs one of the Vitreous Drinker's traits and is also where their namesake is derived from. See, when it hits with that Tongue Lash attack, the creature who's hit by the attack is subject to the vitreous drinker's sight drinking. This means that the poor soul who just got slapped around by a giant tongue has to make a constitution save, and if they fail, they become partially blinded. Thick, milky cataracts overtake their eyes, and the distance at which they can see is reduced to 60 feet. But not only is their vision now limited to a small sphere around them, they also have disadvantage on any and all attack rolls because things even within that distance are still kind of blurry. And the worst part about this is that penalty, that stolen vision, stays in place permanently. The only way for a creature who's had their sight stolen to get it back is to either kill the vitreous drinker once it dies, the curse is lifted from any one sight that it's stolen. Only way that creature can get their sight back is with a greater restoration spell or some other kind of equivalent restorative magic. But that's not all to this ability. It doesn't just hinder the target. The vitreous drinker is also able to see through the eyes of any one sight that it has stolen. Now granted, it can only see through the eyes of one other creature at a time, but that means if it steals your sight and then manages to slip away, it can constantly see through your eyes. And there's nothing to indicate this. Your players might be in this situation and not even realize that they're being spied on. Another kind of damning thing about this in combat is that because the vitreous drinker has stolen the sight from somebody, it can force that creature to look at it as well. So that creature no longer has the option to avert their gaze from the vitreous drinker's horrific visage. They have to look at it and they have to make that constitution saving throw or else they're going to be stunned. So I'm sure you're starting to see how this creature can be quite effective in combat, but also as a shadowy figure behind the scenes, a sort of spy-esque creature. But before we move on to talk about plot hooks, there is one other thing I want to talk about, and that is the spell Flock of Familiars. This is a spell from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, so if the name doesn't sound familiar to you right away, that's probably why. And essentially what it allows you to do is create three or four or five familiars, depending on which level you cast a spell at, but five in the case of our Vitreous Drinker friend here. And that can be pretty scary, because this creature is going to almost always be accompanied by a flock of ravens that are circling around above it, that it can see telepathically through their eyes and communicate with them. And it is able to use these ravens as spies or lookouts to see if anyone's coming towards it. Not to mention the normal shenanigans you can pull off with a familiar, like casting touch spells through them and that sort of thing. And suddenly vampiric touch just got a lot more dangerous. But like I said, as effective as these things are in combat, some of the most interesting uses you'll find for the Vitreous Drinker actually come to us outside of battle. So let's take a moment and talk about some... Do you think he'll be able to see us? In ways you can only imagine. But look, I mean, is he going to be able to chase us? Because if I woke up looking like that, I would just run towards the nearest living thing and kill it. The most prominent and obvious thing about this creature is that, like I said several times, it is a servant of Vecna. So that means immediately, if you have a campaign involving Vecna as your big bad evil guy and boss villain, 
or even if Vecna is just involved in some subtle way, the Vitreous Drinker is an easy fit to use as one of his minions. But even if your big boss isn't Vecna himself and just another lich that may worship Vecna, Again, that would be a really easy way to fit one of these guys into your game as a minion. But of course, it's also possible to use them as a solo encounter. Maybe they just happen upon this creature and that becomes an unfortunate circumstance. Or maybe if the party is hunting for some of the artifacts belonging to Vecna, like the Eye of Vecna or the Hand of Vecna, the Vitreous Drinker crosses paths with them and tries to either follow them to get a lead on where these artifacts might be, or maybe hamper or hinder their progress because it doesn't want them to find the artifact first. And I mean, if you're running a mid-level or lower-ish level game, you could also use one of these creatures as the main villain. I mean, they have a whole slew of motives baked in right there. They're looking for ancient evil artifacts. That's a classic villain motivation. And perhaps they believe one of those artifacts is held somewhere within a vast city or just within the area of a few local towns. The drinker or drinkers, even if there's multiple of them, are looking for this object and they have spies everywhere. The blind beggar who you see on the side of the street in a large city one of the drinker's spies, and they might not even be aware of it. I mean, cultists and cloak and dagger type stuff is totally in play here, so that could be an element you include in a campaign like this. But again, you have to remember, someone whose sight has been stolen doesn't even necessarily know or willfully allow the drinker to see through their eyes. So if they steal the sight of some poor beggar peasant, and that person just happens to be wandering around town, the drinker can access them as like a security camera essentially at any given moment. Maybe no one believes the crazy old man who says he was attacked by some many-eyed monster because he's a town beggar, he's a drunkard, leave him alone. He just kind of talks craziness all the time, right? But what if there's a little bit more to that than meets the eye? You could even use that as a plot device for setting this thing up way later. Maybe at the beginning of the campaign, there's a blind beggar who harasses the party in the streets or something and you just play it off as he's this crazy guy but much later they come to this realization that this blind beggar was actually right. It could also be that some villainy is afoot and there's a rash of blindness within the city and the party kind of has to figure out that it's not just a random disease it's that people are being attacked and that something is causing them to go blind on purpose. Maybe it seems this villainous force is always one step ahead of them it just somehow knows what their next move is almost before the party even does it seems. And only by figuring out that those who are blinded in this town or city or whatever are actually conduits for the sight of the drinker and that's how it's been able to see where they are and what they're doing at pretty much any given moment will they be able to actually defeat it or trick it into a place where it can't escape. I think this monster is just powerful enough and can be played in the right way where it would make a really satisfying and awesome one-shot kind of campaign or even just a small arc to a greater campaign. But yet it's not so powerful that it would have to be the end of the entire game or so powerful that you need to be high tier players to be able to defeat it. But no matter how you use this monster, if you would like to use it, the stat block is in the description of this video below in the form of a Google document. And if you want the monster manual style page with all the cool splash artwork and backstory stuff, you can also find that on my Patreon page. Something else you can find on my Patreon page too, which I haven't really talked about yet on the channel, but consider this the official announcement, is that I am currently working on a supplement for D&D 5th edition that includes one new subclass for every single one of the core classes. I've been working really hard on this. I think it's gonna turn out absolutely awesome. And once it is done, you'll be able to find it on the DMs Guild, of course. But for those of you who are subscribed on my Patreon at any level, including the $1 tier, you can also see the previews as I'm working on them and as we're play testing them and that sort of thing. And of course, once I actually do release the product, anyone who has been subscribed to my Patreon at the $3 tier for at least a month is going to get a copy of it for free. So you guys can look forward to that within about a month or so. But ultimately, that is everything I've got to talk about today. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think about this monster. Let me know if you're planning on any crazy Halloween shenanigans and you have questions or things you want to ask about that. You can find me on Twitter or Discord to talk about those things. And of course, if you have a monster you'd like to see from back in the day converted and talked about on my channel here, please leave a comment and 
tell me all about it. But that is everything for today. So thank you again for watching. I do appreciate it so much and I will see you in the next video. Until then.